Hey everybody, uh, welcome to some fun Zelda stuff for the next hour. Uh, we are very excited to be doing a lovely panel with everybody here for PAX Online. Uh, this is the first of two panels that um, myself and all these lovely people here are doing. Um, we wish we could be with you guys in person, but we're very happy to be part of the PAX Online um, series of events. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit over the course of the next hour about the history of music within The Legend of Zelda. Uh, but before we get started, I want to very quickly introduce you all to what we believe is the earliest piece of Zelda music released onto the world. Did you see the latest Nintendo newsletter? Whoa, nice graphics. I'd like to get my hands on that game. You mean you haven't played it yet? We can play it on my Nintendo Entertainment System. It's the Legend of Zelda and it's really rad. Those creatures from Ganon are pretty bad. Octoroks, Tech Tech's levers too. But with your help, our hero pulls through. Yeah, go Link. Yeah, get some. Awesome. Intense. The Nintendo Entertainment System. Your parents help you hook it up. I hope you enjoyed watching one of the earliest pieces of Zelda music released onto the world. Obviously, that is the commercial for the original Legend of Zelda on the NES. But from that to what we have now, the franchise has evolved a lot when it comes to its music. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. But before we do that, let's introduce ourselves. We are all from Zelda Universe. Uh, we're one of the largest and longest running online communities dedicated to the Legend of Zelda. We do pretty much everything from having an active forum, to covering gaming news, to creating entertainment content that you enjoy on Twitter, YouTube, and Twitch, and Instagram, and all the fun places. My name is Alex Rosenberg. I am the media director here at Zelda Universe, so all of the people um, that you see here that do all the cool stuff for YouTube, I, I oversee all the people. I've been a huge fan of Zelda music for, honestly, the entirety of my existence as a Zelda fan. Um, I love Ocarina of Time, I love Breath of the Wild stuff. My personal favorite music, though, would be Ganondorf's fight from Ocarina, but we'll talk a little bit why I think that's cool later. My name is Brandon Acosta. I am a voice actor. I've done plenty of voice acting for Zelda Universe and its dubs, uh, like Hyrule Warriors, uh, Skyward Sword, a lot, all that stuff. Um, I really like Zelda, which you know is not, not surprising. I, you know, it's, I got the scarf right here, and I also do stuff for. Um, Hades Misguidance, love the Zelda series and, you know, getting to be a part of this team and, like, do a lot of cool stuff like these panels and going to E3 with them is super awesome. If I had to pick one song from the Zelda series, it'd be very tough because, I mean, the entire series is so, like, closely linked to music, but I'd probably have to say The Ballad of the Windfish. I'm Chloe Kirk, I'm project manager for Zelda Universe, so most of the things I do is behind the scenes, I keep everything moving and running. Um... But I do occasionally do things like features and columns, and I was part of the Youthon this year, so that was fun. Um, my favorite piece of music in the Zelda franchise is Gerudo Valley, and I am really hoping that it makes a comeback in Breath of the Wild 2. I'm Eden Biskin. Um, I am the executive producer of the current incarnation of our podcast, ZU Cast. Uh, I actually was on the original incarnation of over probably about a decade ago and I had a segment where I discussed the music so this is really exciting for me to sort of be getting back to that. I love this I love Zelda music. I listen to it on a regular basis and I actually imported the Breath of the Wild soundtrack. So I couldn't pick just one piece of music uh, so I, I picked two. Uh, uh, number one in no particular order is uh, Midla Midna's Lament from Twilight Princess, mm. a game that is near and dear to my heart. I actually have uh, Zario's Twilight Symphony, which I highly recommend, but maybe talk about that later. Um, and The Song of Time, but like the whole thing is one of the most beautiful slash sad pieces I've ever heard. So I love it. Those are both really beautiful sad pieces. I'm not a sad person. <laughs> It's you just like sad things? Sad. I just like sad things. Yeah. <laughs> hey everyone, uh, I'm Owen. I am a producer here at Zelda Universe uh, on the ZU cast, and I am also a moderator on the ZU forums. 
Um, I've also appeared in, in various uh, segments on that podcast, but this is my first time appearing uh, with a face attached to the name on any kind of ZU media. <laughs> so, yes, thank you. I, <laughs> I'm kind of excited about this. Um, I would say that my favorite piece, which I can guarantee I am stealing from no one, is the In the Field uh, piece from The Legend of Zelda Spirit Tracks, which oh, is yes. a game people, uh, I feel like, overlook a lot when talking about really, really solid soundtracks, and I feel like that piece is just very quintessentially Zelda, so. So that's the one where you're, like, in the overworld but not on the train? Yes. It gets overlooked a lot. I love that piece. The whole, the whole game. Like, really. That's so yeah, niche, in an entire too. I was segment unexpected. About, about how much I love that game and about how I'm so sad that no one remembers it. People lump it together with Phantom Hourglass as a thing. It doesn't deserve that. Salutations, ladies and gents. My name is Peyton Garrett, also known as Emperor P. I'm a media guy here at CU, so I participate in things such as the podcast, and I have a YouTube show, as well as our Twitch team. And then I also do special events such as PAX and uh, the Youthon, which is our big charity event every year. Uh, I'm probably most well known for being the general youngin and putting some gray hairs on people that do not need gray hairs yet. I have a few, few favorite pieces. Uh, typically I'd go with something stupid like Malamar, but recently I've been vibing to Corrupted Land from Spirit Tracks, which is kind of the darker version of the overworld theme. It's a really good piece. Uh, but... I played Skyward Sword recently a while back, and man, the Song of the Hero is such a good piece as well. Mm. So that's what I'm gonna go with. Interesting, we have a lot of Spirit Tracks uh, opinions on this panel so far, wow. Um, but obviously, as you probably just saw, everybody here has very different uh, views and favorite Zelda tracks. And that's because there's a lot of really great music in Zelda. There is no surprise that with more than 35 years of history, like, there is just so much there with very recognizable and iconic pieces of music. To the point where the Zelda music is so iconic that there is a game available now to buy and play that is all about Zelda music. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Before we even get to that, let us rewind the clock all the way back to the NES days. So, the NES uh, had two Zelda games on it. The original, Legend of Zelda, and Zelda 2 Adventure of Link. And I have to say that both are pretty memorable in terms of their music. Um, and one of the reasons why I think that is, is because they had to do with a lot of hardware limitations, and the fact that they were able to get around them to create this iconic music is really not just inspiring, but really fascinating. Like, the NES couldn't play, like, MP3s. So there is, like, a dedicated, like, sound system on that chip, which was limited to, like, five channels, where you had two pulse channels, which were used for melody stuff. You had a triangle channel that was for bass. And then you had a noise channel and one channel that you could do, like, a PCM sample, which is how, like, in Mario 3, you got, like, the steel drums. That was it. All of your stuff had to go through that, and on the small memory that the NES even had. And that's like, and that causes a lot of challenge, because the music had to be catchy and dynamic, but you had to make sure it repeated and it was very small. Because, you know, after a while, those same eight bars over and over then are gonna get a annoying, so it had to be something. Uh, it was just, it's just a fascinating thing. Uh, how, what do you guys think about, like, the original Zelda and, like, Zelda 2's music? Um, Castle is one of my favorites from Zelda 2. Um, that's just a really good song. I really like that it was included in Smash later on. That was actually the first time I heard it was in Smash and then realized it was from Zelda 2, so I think just the fact that it can keep popping up even now proves how good it is. I think one of the one of the coolest things about about the music of these earlier games is that by nature of the fact that they were so limited in the hardware that they used and in terms of their sound and uh, 
uh, kind of elaboration on the various melodies, uh, is that, you know, throughout all of the Zelda games, you can kind of repeat all of these different kinds of, of songs, but even every single time you have a new sound that you can add to it or a new way you can contextualize it. So I, I think um, about the, the original Zelda in particular, the fact that, um, you know, just the overworld theme, you know, just, just the theme of the first place that you visit in the entire game, I mean, the entire map, really, has, has kind of gone on to become, like, the de facto theme of the entire series, and it's a melody that anybody, even if they don't play video games, has probably heard on some level. It just speaks to, the like, the staying power of that, and, like, Koji Kondo especially, like, his, his skill is amazing. Right, and last, from what I remember looking up, is that, like, that theme kind of came out kind of near the very tail end, because I know they, well, he wanted to use, like, the Bolero music, mm -hmm. and he couldn't get that right because it wasn't in public domain at that point, and so he sort of threw together something, and that became the, the theme. Now, it's, and like, one of the most iconic pieces of video game music in history. As I recall, it was it was only several months off from entering the public domain, so you know, we were that close to that being the sound of Zelda. And then it became even better. Yeah. Which I think is kind of cool. Um, in terms of what you think about, in terms of like, the music, what do you think did... What was better? Did you think Zelda 2 had better music or Zelda 1? That's tough. It's really yeah, tough. Yeah, like, I don't know. Because they all had very different sort of things. Because, like, Zelda 1, you had... The overworld, you had the dungeon theme, which was the same for every single dungeon. You had Death Mountain, and then you had the death music. Mm -hmm. Like, Zelda 1 does not have that much. Zelda 2, which, because it is very different, has a lot more nuance because you have the, n the normal world, you've got the town, you've got boss fights, you have the side-scrolling stuff. You do have, like, I think a game over music. The theme... And then the the temple themes. So there's, which is interesting because it's working with the same amount of space, but the nuance is there. It's it's a hard question to answer because uh, you know with the first game, just even though it's not a lot of music, the the music that's there is so iconic today. And I love the music in, in Zelda 2 as well. Like immediately the cat the not the castle the town thing comes to mind. And, uh, just the normal battle whenever you're fighting somebody in the world map is also amazing. And definitely, like, the temple theme, as Chloe said, I, like, in Smash, everybody knows that song, just because of that game. I think what's also interesting, too, is that, like, music has always been sort of used as a device in Zelda, because since the pretty much the very beginning, Link has had an instrument of some sort. We have a recorder that is in both games that he plays to do certain stuff. And that continues into A Link to the Past on the Super Nintendo, which had a lot more tracks because obviously it was running on better hardware. So now we have two dungeon themes instead of one. Mm -hmm. um, we have the ocarina that he uses to warp. But now we have a much more full soundtrack. We have a much stronger group of, th of, of like songs for locations and stuff like that. Um, and even as that tech improved even further, we even get more of that in something like, surprisingly, Link's Awakening, which, even when it was released on Game Boy, which was, like, slightly more powerful than the NES, you, you, they were still able to add more tracks and add more to the gameplay, because music is super-duper important, because you're just creating melody by collecting instruments. How do you feel like Link's Awakening and, like, A Link to the Past would have hold up in terms of their music? I think that... A Link to the Past's soundtrack uh, set. The first game uh, gave us like the overworld theme, and that's pretty much it as far as I like really iconic, at least for me. But A Link to the Past gave us more themes, like the Hyrule Castle theme. Mm -hmm. Um, Zelda's Lullaby. Zelda's Lullaby, yeah. Kakariko Village. The Dark World. The Dark, the Dark World, World, yeah, oh my gosh. Dark World, Death Mountain. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm So I feel like in some ways A Link to the Past is really what, both in its music and all the other things it introduced, 
was really the foundation for the series as we know it today. Yeah. And... I was gonna, I was gonna say that uh, to the event of like Link to the Past was the game where a lot of the major elements of Zelda were codified. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. Yeah. so that is a very big element too. How do you feel like uh, the remake of Link's Awakening affected that music? Because I feel like the music in Link's Awakening, the remake especially, were really, really well done. And we'll talk a little bit about why some of that stuff is when we get to our modern era. But how do you feel like the adaptation of it ends up being? Do you feel like that music sort of really stands out even more? The thing about Link's Awakening is that going back to the, uh, the subject of, you know, how, how they had to make music for this hardware that really couldn't do a whole crazy amount, right? Like, all the music was written for the Game Boy, and even then, like, Link's Awakening has, in my opinion, one of the best soundtracks in the whole franchise, especially when you consider, like, the Ballad of the Windfish, Mommy Village, the over, like, the, the Sword Search, <laughs> love, love the music in that game, and the, the Link, well, the way that Link's Awakening, the remake, kind of handled it, it kind of just layers more stuff on top of that, which I like. But to me, like the original, just the way it's it's played out on the original hardware is, is really, really good to me. We'll get a little bit about like the specifics about why I feel like the remake is, goes on a much bigger direction when we get to mm. our modern era. Um, because there were a lot of major improvements from that. Because um, as technology got better, so did the music. And um, the N64 era is where things start getting really interesting for Zelda. Which is partially because of Ocarina of Time. Ocarina of Time is a majorly important game to the franchise. We'll talk a lot more about it in the panel that we're doing uh, on the history of Zelda. But it is a massive shift in Zelda. It is the first time Zelda has been in 3D. Mm -hmm. And because of that, um, and because they're using different hardware, there's a lot of technology that they can use to create more atmospheric and specific music for each area. Lots of very catchy music in Ocarina, uh, but a lot of it's now atmospheric and specific. Each dungeon now has its own theme. There is no generic dungeon theme. Every single dungeon has its own theme to it. The Lost Woods, for example, the music there guides you through it. That's the only way you can really get through it unless you memorize it. Then you have the, the stuff with the ocarina too, where the ocarina not only allows you to play all of these this music, but then helps you transport to these areas that do require it. Um, what specifically stood out for you guys in Ocarina of Time, personally? I think, uh, to me, one of the coolest things, um, that produced, like, most of the kind of, well, not, I wouldn't say most, but a lot of the melodies that people really specifically remember is the ocarina as a, as a gameplay element, um, which was really cool because in the earlier games, you know, you're limited in what you can do uh, technically, whereas with the ocarina, you're limited in a much more self-imposed kind of way because you have to make the, the song playable for uh, the players. You have to make it recognizable in a very short number of notes. And you also have to make it mem memorable enough that people can just kind of take up their instrument and play it. Which kind of, in the same way that those earlier games created uh, songs that can be, you know, expanded upon a lot, uh, the same was done here with those uh, arena songs. Yeah, uh, and even allowing it to be dynamic with the Hyrule Field, Sunrise and Sunset, how there's specific battle themes entering and finishing a battle, um, or when it's like when you're near an enemy, entering that combat music, for sure. Um, what about the rest of y'all? What do you? What did you guys sort of like think? I mean, what stood out to you when you were playing Ocarina of Time? Well, I played Ocarina of Time actually a lot later than the rest of the Zelda games. It was the last Zelda game I played before Breath of the Wild, and that was me playing it live. So I played it for the first time in like 2016, 2017. And going back to it as someone who had played future games first, like Twilight Princess and Wind Waker, which we'll get to more of later, you can recognize the themes. And it's incredible to see just how many minor, minor nuances, you know, the item get theme had been more expanded on to be a little bit more of an epic chest opening. The concept of enemy battles, you know, when you, you can hear the enemies there because there's the subtle buildup of music that just says, hey, 
there's enemies nearby. You can't see them, but they're there. So, you can definitely tell, and in my opinion, Ocarina of Time does it more than A Link to the Past does it, how Ocarina really influenced the future of the Zelda series and kind of not just more advanced music, but more dynamic music with what's happening in the setting. I think for the first time, the music was really part, I think, as Peyton uh, mentioned just now, that music became part of the game's experience, the experience of the game mm. uh, for the first time. So it didn't really, it wasn't just uh, where you were at any given time. Like, there, there aren't that many cutscenes in the game, but some of them have their own themes. Characters had their own themes. So this was the first game in the series that really uh, created uh, liked motifs around certain characters and certain situations and that has become kind of central to uh, a lot of video game composing is creating mm -hmm. motifs for characters and uh, moods and things like that so that was revolutionary an excellent example of that, that i forgot to mention earlier is ganon's tower mm -hmm. yeah Oh, man. The buildup of the organ and just the yeah. adding of the instruments as you climb higher. Yeah. It's a great lead up to that final climactic battle. And then jumping directly in from there into the Ganondorf fight, which, first of all, the Ganondorf fight is intense in terms of even just its time signature. Because it's a, it's a 2316, I want to say. Which is sounds right. I think I think so. That it's, sounds like it's right. It's pretty intense, <laughs> um, but it works super duper well, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things, well, reasons why I think it just resonates with me the most, personally. But then you look at what Ocarina did, and then you go and look at what Majora's Mask did, <laughs> which, in a very short time frame. They start adding even more motifs, like the variations, with Clock Town specifically, of how day one, it's very chipper, upbeat, all that stuff. Day two, it's got some rain, but nothing super crazy. And then we hit day three, <laughs> oh, where you still hear the theme. It's a little bit faster, but then there's an underlining level of tension and darkness as a base and you start noticing like feeling the direness of the situation it's and... like they put anxiety and just like just printed it onto a song <laughs> it's so bad if, yeah if you could eject anxiety into music it would be that yeah yeah it, that's honestly very very like well put honestly for majora's mask but and it's the whole feeling of that third day in general. It's what they were going for. Which is why the last six hours also really resonate in that way, too. Once it hits uh, midnight and you have that last six hours, that music is incredibly haunting. Yeah. But it makes me, I, I cry when I hear that. It's like... It, I always think the, uh, of the bells, like, just going off. Like, oh, this uh, is yeah. it. We're about to die. And it's everywhere, you know? Yes. That, that that melody is wherever you are in Termina. Yeah, that does not matter where you are. I think maybe unless you're in a boss battle, but after that point, that is it. Everything else fades and that's all you hear. And I think that is a really very beautiful, very poetic sort of choice, but it is very haunting. And it's, as someone who has mixed feelings about Majora's Mask, I feel like that's one of the things that like I can't, I, I can't not like say is amazing the music in majora's mask has always been i think one of my favorite parts of it um and there are amazing stuff of which we'll talk later of some of the music um and how it's been taken and run with but it also expanded a lot of other great things like instruments we got some drums we got some pipes we got a sick ass guitar ah uh, not an entire band and we had a whole band yeah yeah indiegogos with some Zelda ska, hopefully. Oh God! Look, <laughs> Hyrule would have ska. Let's no, be clear. No, 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 Rosenberg. Ska's this is where I draw the line. Be the one to do it. 
You no, draw this is the where line. the line is drawn. You draw the line at Ska? Okay. Yes. <laughs> I will dance to Malomar, but I will not. I, when Ska is brought up, we're through. Nah, 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 nah. But uh, like we were mentioning before, like the songs that the ocarina had are short. But they are iconic. Song of Healing is iconic. Elegy of Emptiness, iconic. For probably not the best reason, but... Um, do you guys have a specific favorite piece of music from Majora? Oh my god, I have to talk about this. Yes. So, so I, it, I was going to do like, oh, I'm going to pick two songs, but then I decided no, nah, because I don't want to steal this one from somebody else. The Song of Healing is incredible. The, like... It's the, it's the first example I can think of of something that is present in other games in the series where it's just another song but reversed. And it's still incredible. Like, the like when I think of a song of healing, I think of so many moments in the game, like with Kathy and Andrew and with Pamela and her and her dad. And it's just like the like the pain that is present in that song and it just it just sets the tone for the entire game. It's incredible. Yeah, it's, I think, one of the first things I think about, about actually, now I think about it with Majora, is Song of Healing. Above, I think, even the Majora theme and Stone Tower. Yeah. yeah think, that that song things, is Majora's Mask. One of the coolest things Majora's Mask did, in my opinion, which, which had happened to a degree in previous games, but to a much greater degree, in my opinion, Majora's Mask, was the, the kind of tying of these specific songs very directly into emotional kind of story beats, where when you think of in, in Ocarina, maybe you'll think of like the Nocturne of Shadow or something, and you'll think of the location it took you to or where you learned it, or, you know, maybe some of the characters associated with it, but, you know, when you think of the Song of Healing or one of those other uh, songs from Majora's Mask, your mind immediately goes to these incredibly emotional moments with these characters that you've spent the entire game with. I, th I think it's the thing that makes Majora's Mask so unique of a game. Of it's, it, it's way more emotionally connected, which I think I, I really appreciate. I also believe, and it ties into my favorite piece, that Majora's Mask was the first one that really started messing with inversion of music. Yeah. Like as uh, as Brandon mentioned earlier, with the song of healing being in, in um, is a song of being inverted. Yeah. Time. Isn't yeah. it sorry a song? No, it is sorry a song. My bad. I thought yeah. It was... But there's also, as uh, Rosenberg briefly mentioned earlier, the stone tower, in which the whole concept is it was a piece that is played forwards and backwards. It's meant to be inverted at times. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of my favorite pieces is the inverted stone tower temple. Like that one really stuck out to me. In Majora's Mask. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not actually my favorite piece, although all my favorite pieces come from Ikana. I have to give mine to Castle Castle Ikana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ikana Castle's got some good stuff. Ikana in general, really, really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Song of Storms, the uh, the Stone Tower Temple, Ikana Castle, just oh, all really right. good pieces. You're and I and I and I love. There. I love how they use the like the the song of time and how there's different versions of it that mess with the gameplay, like the inverted song of time, the song of double time. Yeah, so good. which yeah. I think is also smart, and I think is also as a design choice as well because it is easier to co-op the same song that you already have programmed. Yeah, which I mean, Majora's Mask had a very short development cycle, so that would also be why. Mm -hmm. But. Um, it sets a lot of the groundwork for what we see in later titles, which brings us into the early 2000s. 2000s were a very big time to be a Zelda fan because we had a lot of games in this era, uh, like almost one a year, uh, which was kind of insane. Um, and musical instruments were still a massive deal in this era. Most games that were released in the 2000s had some sort of playable instruments, with I think Four Swords and Four Swords Adventures being the exception. And obviously one of the big ones, Wind Waker, which mm -hmm. technically has a baton rather than an instrument, but it's still themed around music and you can now control nature. And you so can, like, you, you conduct two concerts. You, mm, technically. Um, we'll get to that though, but talking about Wind Waker specifically, 
What did you think about Wind Waker in terms of their music? The thing about Wind Waker is like there's it's it's continuing that trend of uh, Ocarina where you know kind of like music is tied to like certain characters and certain moments and like the first thing I can think of is just riding on the Great Sea and the Great Sea theme and uh, I'll let somebody else piggyback because I'm drawing blank right now. Yeah, the... like Dragon Roost is one of the, oh, yeah. the really good themes. That's one of my favorites in Wind Waker. I'm surprised Great Sea came up before Dragon Roost because I feel like when most people think of Wind Waker, Dragon Roost usually comes up first. I, when <laughs> I think of Wind Waker, I think of the main theme. I'm going to say something that will ruin my Zelda cred. I have never been that crazy about Dragon Roost. Ooh. What Sorry. specifically but, about it? I don't know. It's just like... It, it, it's just one of those things that like you find out oh everybody is like in love with this track and I was like oh it's okay I like it but I've never been oh, like oh okay so you're the hipster it. yeah he's he's a hipster I'm a hipster I mean yeah. you, you see that you see that scarf right yeah <laughs> Wind Waker was the first one I ever played so I think that's where they again as I said earlier they they you know Ocarina of Time is where they really started messing with dynamic music but I think Wind Waker is where they perfected it my favorite boss boss fight and moment of the game is the mini boss of Tower of the Gods against your first dark night of the game, your first official dark night of the game, in which the music is almost expressly themed about you doing the timed parry attacks. And all and a lot of the music throughout the game is timed with those parry attacks. Mm -hmm. You press it at the right moment and there's a little jingle or like a correct sound that plays along with the music as you're fighting. Yeah, like that's true. Like it is way more reactive in Wind Waker than it is in literally any other game to the point where, yeah, anytime you actually land a hit, the music and percussion reflect that, which I think is incredibly smart, and it's really a reflection of just how smart the music is in uh, Wind Waker, which is just, it, it blows my mind a lot. Um, what's interesting is that, like, it's, you know, you don't play it, you conduct but you now have the time signatures and the beat to now uh, keep in track of because, you know, they're not all of the songs are the same length and you now have to be in time, which I can imagine that could have been really <laughs> difficult for people who are not as musically inclined. Just thinking about how Nintendo secretly managed to teach kids time signatures. Let's be real. Who here learned music from Wind Waker before their music class? I didn't understand it. I was stupid. I was like, <laughs> what? Negative years old? I was one years Except old. Except yeah. Peyton. <laughs> Just me? No? Okay. Wow. Um, hey, but props to you, man. That's actually impressive. So. Yeah. Moving on, though, the Twilight Princess. Twilight Princess, though, is a little <laughs> bit weird because at E3, um, there was a live symphony that played for the trailer, so everyone's expectations for, like, an actual, like, orchestrated pieces of, like, music to be in the game, and it didn't happen. <laughs> it was still, like, digital, like, non-symphonic music, uh, which I think a lot of people were very, very sad about. But what's... I feel like... And this is also my personal take... There was, so, there was like maybe four or five tracks in Twilight Princess that I think are really good. The rest of them are just kind of there. I'm gonna fight you on this. Yeah, I know he will. <laughs> Twilight Princess was the game that got me into the series, having previously played the Game Boy <laughs> Advance port of A Link to the Past and given up because I was terrible at it and also was afraid of getting nightmares. But, uh,. I've had a very long uh, relationship with Twilight Princess soundtrack because I used to listen to it all the time. <laughs> and did, so... you, did you have those CDs from Nintendo Power? No, I listened to it online. Okay. That's what uh, I did. Uh, this is a rare bunch. I think this is the first time on a Zelda Universe music panel where we outnumber... We outnumber uh, Rosenberg on people who both <laughs> like spirit tracks and like Twilight Princess. This is rare. Well, okay. 
let me explain though. Like the tracks they really like in *Twilight Princess*: Minda's Lament*, *Gerudo Valley*. Like the *Gerudo Desert* is. Uh, yeah, every, everybody's gonna go towards *Gerudo Desert* and *Minda's Lament*. Those two are impeccable. Like honestly, I I have objectively said that *Minda's Lament* is one of the best pieces of music in Zelda. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, uh, objectively, it is the piano yeah. is haunting and all that. But for me, and I think this is, this is just because of the fact that um, Twilight Princess is trying to be Ocarina of Time and there's a lot of vast bits of nothing. But there, there is more thematic music, but I, I don't know. For me, I don't feel like it resonates nearly as much as others in there. Um, not to say that there's not, but it's got like nothing. Because there is stuff. Like Minna's Lament, Grudo Desert, Malamar. There are good yeah. pieces of music. Thing is, you're, you're comparing but... like an eight to a ten. Like it's still amazing. <laughs> but... That's the thing. Remember, yeah. we're all spoiled people. Yeah. All Zelda games are good games. Like we will rail on the game, but remember, we're like we're railing about a franchise that hasn't really had a bad game. The I think the worst rated Zelda game is still a seven. You know? Yeah. So it's like eight point eight. Seven point eight out of ten. Too much water, even. <laughs> Not, yeah. but still. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> for me, I, I can just off the top of my head think of, like, Oregon Village, Ook's theme, mm. this Mallow game's Mark. rendition of Kakariko Village, Beast Ganon, of course, the aforementioned uh, Midna's Lament are all, like, super memorable to me. I think it, it it's often that this game is kind of thought of as the big adventurous kind of game, and then... Skyward Sword is is conversely thought of as like the the smaller like more emotional more character driven more story based, but I really think that people do not give enough credit to Twilight Princess for its quieter moments, mm -hmm. um, especially mm -hmm. in the music and as, uh, of course in the in the actual plot. But I feel like the music really really complements that very well. I know it's kind of cheating because it technically originated in a previous game, but the Serenade of Water Rutella's theme is a great example of that. The whole concept of the Zora child dying and just hearing these uh, Zora-based kind of harp laments throughout the game. I, I also love how how in the um, the howling segments and a lot of yes. these draw on yeah, songs yeah, yeah. that we hear in previous games, and so you know we're, we're calling back to those titles in. Uh, in, in music, but even like within the game, we're talking to this kind of old soldier from, from a very long time ago, so it's, it's bridging that kind of gap in time in, in two different ways. Hey, I forgot to mention this uh, when we were talking about Wind Waker, but the, the final boss with Ganondorf, his, that theme that plays through all that is incredible. But I oh, it's one of my favorites. It's, it's one of my favorites too, but I think the one from Twilight Princess is better, just for how like climactic and epic it feels. Yeah, four the part, fight four part battle. Matched. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? What? It's a four part epic battle. It's extremely underwhelming, but that's another discussion. The ba the fight <laughs> itself is kind of underwhelming, but the song that plays like when you're actually at the final moments, just fighting him sword to sword, is super cool. Clearly, you guys haven't played it without the hidden skills. It's painful without hidden oh, skills. Yeah, it's real bad. You just need a fishing rod. <laughs> It's so hard. I just watched but, uh, Peyton just like get fully <laughs> offended by by that opinion. An interesting thing to note, because uh, going back to what Owen was saying about the Howling Stones earlier, while they do include previous melodies, in the specific uh, set of seven or six, um, in the natural order you're supposed to see them, it does start that way. It starts with the older Zelda themes. But as it goes on, it changes and it's less and less from older themes, and it eventually ends up with the last two songs being compositions from Twilight Princess. It's almost kind of a shift to say, hey, here's the past, this is something you'll you'll like, into the Twilight Princess theme, and then things like that. A little more of a modern rendition of something you'll be able to recognize. Kind of like a passing of the torch that eventually got unlit because Breath of the Wild existed. Right, and that's what reason why Twilight Princess has a major highlight. Whereas like on the DS, it didn't, like, there wasn't as much, like, Phantom Hourglass doesn't really offer much to that. There is no instrument in there. There's a lot of repeats. It's got four pieces! We moved on! <laughs> no, I was, I was talking about Phantom oh, Hourglass. Oh, yeah, it's got, like, yeah. four pieces of music. It's lame. <laughs> I don't care I what anybody railing. says about Phantom Hourglass. Linebeck's theme is incredible. 
It's worth it. It's yeah. got that. And then we got Spirit Tracks, which got a pan flu, which helps you progress through the game and provide other things. And then uh, you had the blow into the microphone, which um, don't do it on a subway or a public place. It feels bad. also it doesn't work if it's don't like do it, it doesn't on... work in like a car even. No. Or a train. Don't do it on this either. Or the either. Wii U. It's just it's not. <laughs> just, just, just don't. Don't recommend. I have a hot take about this though. Okay. Which is that before we move on. Flute, even though it becomes at points practically unusable, is still better <laughs> than the harp from Skyward Sword. Oh, that's it creates. Music. Ooh. That's well, not even, that's that not is a hot take. take. And you're gonna get to that hear that hot, hot take, take in a hot second when we get over the Skyward Sword. Burns theme, and the final boss theme. Uh, Two of the best uh, songs in the entire series. That's Agreed. it. The boss themes in general were really yes. dynamic throughout oh, yeah. it. Yeah. I'll also make a note that like my favorite theme from Spirit Tracks is when you're on the train. Yeah. On the train. Like I'm surprised that wasn't mentioned. I'll play Train Sim World and put the, the Spirit Tracks music on. <laughs> and that's really something you you want. You know, you want that overworld to be something that you know you can listen to for a long period of time because sometimes you are in the overworld for a long period of time. I feel like the Zelda series as a whole does a really good job of creating memorable and uh, memorable overworld themes that don't really wane on you after long periods of time. It's very clear with a lot of these Zelda games that like they're starting to incorporate music into the design of these games. And that continues hard as we enter the 2010s. But before we even get into the games themselves, and as this was sort of happening, a lot more concerts start happening around games. We have video games live. And then in 2011, there is a 25th anniversary Zelda concert that is done that turns into the, the Zelda Symphony and then into what we know as Symphony of the Goddesses. Um, <laughs> Got my shirt on. I know. I, I, I have my shirt, this. but I decided to wear the Zelda Universe one. And, which I appreciate. Uh, and you know, those, you know, those that music was shown in a concert setting to reflect upon the games and show all that stuff. Um, where the baton for the conductor was the Wind Waker one, which I thought uh, was a cool touch. You now, could buy it, and I never got it, and I, I regret it to this day. Mase does the well. same thing. Now, everyone here has seen the concert, I believe, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh my god. Twice. I know, I know Chloe has gone for ZU. I went when I went to E3 2015. That was my first E3. Yeah, I went in 2015. How, how did, how was everyone's overall experiences at Zelda Symphony? Incredible. Oh, yeah, it was amazing. One of the greatest like, experiences just, of my life. Yeah, mine was at like an old theater, so it was just even better. Like it was just a really great scenery too. Yeah, I, I think I was, I was at the, the Disney concert hall uh, oh, yeah? in LA. Cause that was like the two days before E3. And I remember like crying through like at least half of it because Same. of that music. I went to Dr. Phillips in Orlando and just, just just the fact that it plays like moments from the games as they're doing the the song, man, it just takes it to another level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's less of a symphony. Like most people think a symphony or a concert, and they're like, oh yeah, we're gonna sit down in formal attire. And I remember because I was I was a young boy. I was like, I was like thirteen or fourteen when I went, so I had to go with my parents. And my dad's like, yeah, you need to dress up. It's a symphony. I'm like, dad, this isn't that type God. of symphony. It's more of it's more of an experience. It's kind of like almost a celebration of gaming culture. And it wouldn't be the same if you didn't get to see the visuals on screen alongside the orchestra. I was like 10 or 11, it must have been, when I when I went. And I mean, it was obviously incredible, but one of the main things that I specifically remember jumping off of Peyton was just the, the kind of community there that like, in the lobby, everyone was exchanging street passes. Oh and yeah, everyone was mm -hmm. street right. passes. So yeah. that was, many. That was such a cool thing, just to be in that room full of people who were all there with this common interest. Cosplayers. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is why, yeah. which is why we love packs. <laughs> it's also interesting because I feel like now more and more things are doing those kind of style of concerts, and I don't know how many they had going earlier, and then move on to now where. Or where before you know everything happened, we had not just concerts for Zelda, Pokemon. We had Game of Thrones even did freaking concerts. We have like movies that are There's now Final being Fantasy, done the live. Distant Worlds ones. Distant Worlds. Mm -hmm. There's now so much happening Pokemon. in the same sort of deal. Yes, Pokemon too. Um, mm -hmm. And it was really cool. And that also sort of tied into Skyward Sword because Skyward Sword was also the first game 
to have fully orchestrated music. Um, and it's mostly orchestrated. Most. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's the it's the same orchestra that did Super Mario Galaxy, right? Uh. Because it it sounds very similar. I think I think so. It's the same composer. Primarily. That did like Galaxy. Mahito Yakota. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But even then, there's a lot of amazing music in Skyward Sword, um, where like Girahim's introduction, the battle themes, being in Skyloft, being in the skies, like there's Gruce's a lot of really theme. excellent. Oh, Groose! How could I forget Groose? <laughs> my boy, the, the man of my Gruce own man. heart, He's a chat, the, the first fan. chat. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> Chad, God dang it! I'm not even joking. That's true. I was, he's the I was first Chad in history. To my, to he's my the first younger Chad. brother, but he really is the, the original Chad. I hate that, but it's so true. It's God true. Damn. But that's also <laughs> where used to anyone named Chad. It's also the first like part of like where the there's actual major gameplay mechanics to that part where um. Owen, oh, do you want to explain parts about that mm. with your yeah. hot takes? <laughs> so throughout the game, specifically um, towards towards the second half of it, there are these segments called the Silent Realm, which is uh, where you'll kind of enter a, a slightly altered version of an area you've previously been in with the objective of gathering these... Um, these, uh, I, it's escaping my mind what they're called. But Tears of Light. Yeah. Is that what they're called? Okay. I, I, I couldn't remember because that's what they're also called in Twilight Princess. Same, yeah. I thought yeah. they were called something different. So it is no. um, conceptually a lot like that in Twilight Princess, but in this one, it kind of has a, a time limit um, to it, and there's not really so much a focus on combat, uh, instead stealth. But as a part of this, um, in collecting these different uh, parts of the song with the hero, you're going to have to play the harp um, on tune with uh, Fee Fi singing. <laughs> fi, yeah. And Fi, yeah, that's how I always said it, but then people mess me up. <laughs> <laughs> and I do not like these segments. Well, I, I, I think it, it, my opinion on them is twofold. On the one hand, I think that it's one of the better implementations of a music mechanic into the game in terms of gameplay. I think it's a good gameplay mechanic. I think the sounds created are <laughs> less than pleasing. It doesn't really work, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you feel like a you feel like a child, like just strumming on it, just doing random stuff. I just don't think the game explained the concept well of how to it keep doesn't. it on beat. It there there it is very badly explained how to use the harp. Once you figure it out, you can actually make it sound nice because you realize that it's only you just have to get A to point B within a certain amount of time it doesn't matter how fast or how slow yeah, you yeah. do it mm -hmm. yeah as long as you keep it in time so i just feel like the, if the game had explained it better people would enjoy it a lot more and but i definitely understand your take one of the ways it could have explained it better would definitely have been having you use it in ways that are not just that because throughout the game there are <laughs> other than the uh there, there are very few other locations where it's actually used, and even fewer where it's necessary, which which makes it so that it's it's kind of difficult to get the hang of it. I I, I remember you you can just take it out and just strum on it, right? Yeah. 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 It's so weird. But it's like so hard to play if you're trying yeah. to play like a song. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. You can't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because you have no control over no yeah, compared yeah. to past games. But then you'll see right. Link just go like super hardcore with it when you're not controlling it, and you're like, <laughs> okay. and that's I I the do that. best part. I mean, yeah, watching him go hardcore was great. Um, since we're running a little short on time, we're going to sort of like swing by the rest of these really quickly. Um, we have a link between worlds, uh, also, which uses a lot of a link to the past music in a very similar vein. It um, a link to the past is honestly one of the better, or sorry, a link between worlds is the best, honestly, example of seeing. And I think it was the first one, because obviously the Link to the Past remake hadn't come out, of seeing how technology really did affect how Zelda music was played. Because it's the same music, it's the same themes, literally verbatim, exact same pieces, but it's just on newer yeah. hard, newer hardware and rearranged. Right, yeah. Um, and then we had Triforce Heroes, which 
again, it was mostly on gameplay mechanics and not on audio. But where things really go crazy is with Breath of the Wild, which doesn't have music or a musical <laughs> instrument. But we now have more of a broken melody that is more ambient, so you're listening to certain things on the overworld, but you're not doing much unless it's more of a heightened event, like mm -hmm. Guardians that you're fighting. Where, like, that's <laughs> a very, you know, daunting and very... That's kind that's of another song period. where they they that's took anxiety. they took the anxiety yeah. technology from the song of healing and they reapplied it for the guardian theme. <laughs> the best thing Breath of the Wild brought to the table in terms of music, in my opinion, was just generally boss themes. It had some of the real some of these really catchy boss themes and enemy themes that could just repeat on loop because that's what they're made for. They're made to be those long stints of combat. And, and Other than Skyward Sword, that was. It was really cool to have those really dynamic boss themes because I think mm -hmm. one of the places Skyward Sword fell short the most was its boss themes, where some of them are even reused. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're yeah. Right. Yeah. It's kind of like it. It makes the bosses lose some of their individuality. In yeah. My opinion. Yeah, and then we also have like even more prominent stuff where like you've got the shrines, you've got you mentioned the divine beasts, Hyrule Castle's theme. Yeah. With that full blown yeah. music, like, I absolutely iconic. And then you've got mm -hmm. in the overworld that Opiance with that, a lot of the piano based stuff. Yeah. Which I, I love that. Like, I love having, like, the up blaring music. But here's the thing in a game like that, that gets annoying after 15 hours. So. Mm -hmm. You want to sparse it, and I think Breath of the Wild does a very good job with that. It doesn't. It doesn't try to give you music where you don't need yeah, it, yeah. where it's not needed, because it is an overworld game. It gives you music where there needs to be music. It doesn't try to do anything more than it should. For, for the kind of game that Breath of the Wild is, you know, having it just kind of pop in and out and like be very ambient, like you said, it 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 makes the moments where the music like picks up, like. Hyrule Castle, it makes them hit even more because, like, this is it. This, this is happening. We're finally getting here. Yeah. Or, like, mm. when you're randomly in the desert and you come across the... The Molduga. <laughs> Molduga. Which... That theme is amazing. Yeah. That music slaps. And, mm -hmm. and, and like, back to the subject, oh, when when you hear music, it makes it stand out more. When you're just walking around and you hear Cass's theme, you're like, oh my god, where is he? Yeah, and, and yeah. the music in the overworld is just so thematically consistent with the rest of the game, where, you know, it, it's like, even with the music, it's like you're kind of stumbling across these little ruins of, of a larger kind of theme, as in the world, you're stumbling across these ruins of these, like, structures that used to exist. You know, it's funny that you bring up Cass, Brandon, because, like, his music turns into a storytelling device in the DLC, mm -hmm. which is very music-focused, and I think it adds a lot of great elements to it it's the whole dlc is named after a song i can't believe that was incredible yeah it's which i think is and then, really yeah, the way that's the way that song evolves over the course of the dlc as you like you know learn more about all the challenges it's so good yeah. yeah and then we see even more respect of zelda with our current iteration of really the celebration of everything with zelda and that is with cadence of hyrule which, mm -hmm. look, Cadence is a rhythm game. It is a rhythm game with Zelda and Crypt of the Necrodancer. It's not and just it's important, fun. it's the primary mechanic. It does that while being paired with some of the most iconic pieces of music from Zelda, remixed into a really, like, pulse, beat, bass pounding The term you're track. looking for is absolute banger. Yep. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but it's really great to like w go into an area and randomly just stumble into Death Mountain when you're going from a forest and immediately start hearing the amazing like thing in the guitars of Death Mountain. It's uh, we're also slightly biased because like we know people who did it. We have a lot of because crazy, yeah. Family Jewels. Adrian Figueroa, Nick Lachu, all of our friends, and they're in the game, which I think is incredible. Um, in terms of Cadence, what did you guys feel overall about that game's sort of music really quick? 
Uh, when I walked into the desert and I started hearing Gerudo Valley, I freaked out a bit. Yeah, like I saw it at E3 and I heard Gerudo Valley and I was like, that's it, I'm gonna buy it. Yeah, like, that, that sold me. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> Take the money. I haven't played the game yet, but I've listened to just the soundtrack and oh my gosh. It, re it really is just kind of a celebration. It's kind of hard, Zelda music. but it's fun. We could talk more about Zelda and music for hours and hours. However, we don't have that time, and our time, unfortunately, is up. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the last hour of us exploring the evolution of the music of The Legend of Zelda. Um, on behalf of everybody here at Zelda Universe, we hope you enjoyed the lovely panel today. Uh, if you are watching this live, stick around because we have an amazing panel coming up. Um, but uh, feel free to check us out over at Zelda Universe on the website, which is at ZeldaUniverse.net, or check us out on YouTube and Twitch as well over at Zelda Universe TV, where we're creating all sorts of awesome content. And we hope to see you around and all that kind of stuff. Pax, thank you for letting us host this, and we will see you guys very soon. Anyway, Stan Molomart. Ha 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 ha!